So welcome to the Language Leaders Student Retention Summit. This is a very unique event. I mean, how often do we get uh, three fantastic speakers, all in language education, but from a variety of different segments and all speaking about student and client retention, one of the most critical things to get right in any language business. So let me introduce you to the speakers, um, starting off with Anya Spilker. So Anya has over 10 years of very unique experience. Anya is an entrepreneur and founded the Lower Languages, a platform bridging European companies and skilled German learners from Latin America. And it's now the largest German learning community in Latin America. Very excited to learn more about her uh, talk about target groups and how to think about different target groups when it comes to particularly retention. Next, we're going to be hearing from Christina Eckes. Christina has over 15 years of experience from teaching to administrative roles and with a lot of ed tech experience too. Now, after many years of diverse teaching roles, Christina transitioned to program development for adult learners and focuses on newcomers to the US. And currently, Christina is the Vice President of Customer and Learn Operations at Engine. Uh, Christina's going to be talking particularly about multilingual coaching. I'm really excited about this topic. I didn't know much about it, but I can see that this has a real big impact and it's something that you could possibly try in your own business too. Thirdly, we have Lays Mayoki. Lays has over 12 years experience in client services and customer success. Uh, you might be familiar with Voxy and Lays has been the VP of customer success there for many years. So, Lays is going to be talking as to more about data and the metrics of student and client retention. I think you're going to be fascinated to learn more. So I'll also introduce myself if you don't know me. My name is Alex Asher. Uh, I am the CEO of LearnCube. Uh, we work with you know, hundreds of language companies from over 100 countries around the world. We've delivered over 4 million classes through our virtual classroom made specifically for language education. I'm the author of the LangTech book, and subsequent LangTech in the AI era white paper. Uh, I'm the host of the Language Leaders Summit and the Language Leaders Podcast. So uh, what I'm really wanting to talk to you about today is to really share the impact of the research I've been working on. This is with over a dozen language leaders that weren't able to make uh, this talk, but wanted to share their experience and their advice for language businesses as it particularly relates to student retention. So I'll also be sharing that near the end of this talk. So let's pass over to our first speaker, Anya. Yes, hello everyone. And uh, thank you, Alex, for the invitation, for the nice introduction. I'm very happy to be here because I was actually part of one of your uh, webinars maybe two months ago, and I think it's extremely useful. So I hope that uh, everyone who is here with us um, that you get the most out of it. Um, again, um, in my role here, I have kind of two hats today because obviously we're talking about retention, but I'm also the founder of the company. So it's a lot of the, the business perspective as well that I want to share with you. Um, so my name is Anya. I often say Anya from Alemania. Those of you who speak Spanish might understand it. It means Anya from Germany. I was born and raised in Germany, but live my, my company is actually based uh, in Mexico, and I live between many different countries, mostly between Mexico, the US, and Germany, currently in Germany. And um, yeah, I'm the founder of Zaloa Languages, a language learning platform that breaks the language barriers for young professionals from Latin America that want to work and live in Germany. And um, just by this you know, long mission statement, um, you can see that we have a very clear target group. Um, but I also would like to share with you that this has not always been like this. Um, yeah, what sounds so amazing is a lot of trial and error over the past years, to be honest. Um, I founded Zaloa about nine years ago. And um, if there is one thing that we have learned over the past, um, and I guess, sorry to disappoint many of you now, um, but there is no fast track or there is no quick answer to this retention strategy. What is the best retention strategy? And um, um, yeah, there is not just the perfect solution. And it really, and I think this is for me the most important factor, and this is why I want to highlight it so much today, it's the target group. 
So when we think about language learning, um, we often, basically all of us working in, in the language learning industry, we are very lucky because like by nature, our product or our service requires a lot of time. Nobody is going to learn a language in just three months. We all know that, right? Um, maybe if you're like doing specific trainings for a specific exam, and then once they pass the exam, then it's done. And maybe then you can't really think about retention. But even then, language learning is a never ending story. So in theory, we should have our learners for over years and years. But the reality is that only a very small percentage of all learners stay motivated over time. And so how do they actually stay motivated over time? Well, again, this is what the retention is all about. And I want you, first of all, to really think about this now. Um, your clients, if you think about who they are, if you think about how old they are, what they do in their lives, if you think about how they behave, if you think about whether this is category of B2B business or B2C business, if you think about their financial resources, cultural background, um, learning motivation, their purpose, you can even share that in the chat now, I might read it later. <laughs> but I really encourage you to think about it because your retention strategy should always depend on your target group. And as I said, we've done a lot of trial and error over the past um, years. Um, and why is this so important to like focus on the target group? We haven't done it, to be honest. We haven't always done it. We have lost a lot of money, time, and also energy um, because we haven't done it early enough. Um, and if, if we still got time later, I'm happy to share some of the um, negative experiences um, some of the failures, I would even say. Um, but what is the most important is if if you imagine you, you want a pet, right? Like imagine you want a pet and you feel like, oh, now I'm going to prepare my home for this pet. And you create like the most amazing environment for that pet, right? And then your partner surprises you and you've prepared everything for a cat. But then your partner surprises you with a goldfish, right? And then the environment that you've created well, it doesn't help the goldfish in the end, right? So you've created the environment for the cat to feel at home, but the fish is not going to feel at home in an environment that is for a cat, right? So that's the same with language learners in the end. So you want to create this environment within your classes, within your company, um, in order for the learner to feel at home. And again, what, is it, what does it mean to feel at home? It depends on the age, on the generation. Um, it depends on the financial resources, the cultural background, learning motivation, purpose. But I really want to focus here a little more on the B2B versus B2C. Um, Zaloa Languages is a platform that started with a focus on B2C. That's how we have grown Zaloa. And then it's just over the past three, four years, maybe, that we focused more on the B2B part because, well, during the pandemic, we got a little lucky, I would even say, and then all Latin America currently wanted to learn German. And then most German companies came to us and said, like, hey, we're looking for workforce, skilled workforce, because there is a lack of skilled workforce in, in, in Germany, Austria, and, and many other countries, by the way. Um, but um, can we, like, match your German learners with our um, HR departments. And I was like, sure, that's all our German learners want, right? So in the end, what is important when you distinguish between this B2B and B2C experience is the motivation. So for example, um, sometimes you have in companies in B2B when, when you charge the company and they tell their employees that they need to learn a language, then it's an obligation. Usually when it's privately paid, then it's a personal interest. And that's a big difference. In our case, it's kind of a mix because it starts with the personal interest. The language learner wants to work in Germany, but then the company pays for it. So it's like kind of this win-win-win that we have created. Um, but then another difference is the decision making. So, for example, when you focus on B2B sector, right, you need formal approvals. It takes sometimes months 
and sometimes even years to get those contract signs, right? But then once you have a signed contract, um, you can onboard even more students from the company. And in the B2C sector, I always feel like for me, the B2C sector is always so easy. You organize a webinar, you have plenty of people uh, who participate, and then you have your conversion rate out of that webinar. And well, you can actually really um, create or influence this decision making by personal preferences of your learners. And then one thing that is very, very important as well here, the difference between the B2C and the B2B are the metrics. So the return on investment, obviously a company, they, the retention rate of a company stays higher if you can present an ROI return on investment that is focused on the business values. So if you can show the company listen, what we're doing here with your employees, it brings value to the employees. And that's why your company is going to perform better. So we always have this great example, one of our companies, our clients in Mexico, they became market leader because they started back in 2016 and offered German classes to their uh, employees. And they became market leader because the service they're doing, many other companies do that. But all their employees started to learn German. And obviously, eight years later, most of them have a B2 level. So they can serve a lot of German companies with their service. And that's amazing. Um, and well, on the, on the B2C side, the metrics is also the return on investment, but this is rather based on satisfaction. So it's rather based on your time investment, right? We all, we all get 24 hours, but Sometimes you feel like we don't have enough time. So you show your B2C customer or you want to show your B2C customer your return investment on the satisfaction. And then obviously the support. Don't underestimate the support. There's a big difference between B2B and B2C. If you have um, a B2B client, then you need an account manager. You need like someone who really takes care, not just of the language learner, but also of the company, right? Um, and in the B2C sector, it's super important that you have immediate support. A B2C learner always wants, when there is a problem or a question, they always want immediate support. And they want a community and they need a community, whatever that means to your target group. But this is the most important. So obviously, I could continue for hours about these different target groups. But I wanted to focus on the B2B versus the B2C side, because I know that a lot of um, teachers or especially, um, well, young entrepreneurs have problems with that, right? It can be quite frustrating as well. If we have time later, then we can maybe go back again to some of the uh, failure stories and the Q&A later. But uh, I know that we have amazing, two more amazing speakers that I also want to listen to. So thank you very much. Anya, that was fantastic. I really appreciate that. And we're already getting uh, some questions in the chat. We're looking forward to bring that out in the Q&A. Um, but let me take a moment to introduce you to our second speaker, because we are really going to be, uh, and definitely put in those questions now, but we're going to be passing over to Christina. Um, so as I mentioned before, Christina Eckes has a really remarkable experience um, in a variety of different companies and different uh, language roles. So let's pass it over to Christina. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Anya, um, I just want to say I think what you're doing is amazing. And I'm also interested and uh, curious to learn more during the Q&A. Um, Alex, thanks for having us and for the opportunity today to share and to learn from our colleagues. Um, I'm actually going to echo very heavily what Anya said about motivation, because that is key for what NGEN has done in terms of figuring out how to improve our retention. <clears throat> so. I think it's important to start off uh, by giving a little bit of context, um, what Engine is and who we serve. Our mission is to deliver real world English instruction to the 96% of adult English learners who are not served by the current US system, um, building an engaged, empowered, and fully staffed US workforce. Um, and we do this through relevant career aligned content in concert with wraparound services that include live classes, uh, writing instruction and coaching. Um, and since we're based in the US and our users are newcomers from all over the world, our learners 
um, maybe slightly different from the demographic of users of maybe some classic language learning apps or programs. Um, and our learners oftentimes, um, not always, but often have low levels of digital literacy um, and have a pressing need to get into the workforce. And they want to learn how to integrate socially and engage in their local communities. Um, but that being said, they do have a lot in common with many other language learners all over the world and that they're busy adults and they're balancing language learning with a lot of other priorities. Um, and so the challenge is figuring out how to get them to set, commit to, and reach their goals. Um, at NGen, we want to remove all of the other barriers that come with language learning so that learners can focus on the language learning itself. So the more barriers they face, the more likely they are to procrastinate or ultimately give up and disengage. Um, like Anya mentioned, um, when, they, when they want and need help, they need it immediately. Um, when they are in the platform and doing their lessons, interacting with a live teacher or doing any, any other type of instruction, the lessons themselves are 100% in the target language, in this case, English. Um, but our interface and the support services to the extent possible are in the learner's first language. And so this for us is where coaching comes in. Um, at NGen, we have a team of multilingual, amazing multilingual coaches. And the languages we cover currently are Spanish, French, Haitian Creole, Arabic, Ukrainian, Russian, Portuguese, Farsi, Urdu, and Dari. Um, and these coaches connect with learners throughout their journey to provide support, help them with goal setting, and to create accountability. Um, and I think that the goal setting and the accountability are really key here. Um, when a learner enrolls, they're assigned to a coach who's there to support them throughout their license um, and throughout the entire learner journey. And they stay with that one coach. Um, our coaches have developed a system of three main, what we call touch points or really phases of the learner journey. So the goal of the first touch point is to support the learner in getting started uh, accessing the right content. So of course they need things that are relevant to them in order to stay motivated and, and keep progressing. Um, they work with a learner to explicitly discuss what are your short, medium and long-term goals because the goal can't just be, I, I wanna speak English, right? The, the, the language learning is a tool and a means to something else. Um, so they really talk about those, those greater goals. Um, at the second touch point, they check in on the learner's progress. Um, they help to refine their goals and their plan. So sometimes things change, some things come up and they, you know, their goals change, that happens. Um, at the third touch point, coaches review the learner's progress with them, and they can either at that point help them to re-enroll if they need to continue um, with their language learning with NGen, or what I really love is that they help them figure out what their next steps are. So do they need to enroll in, uh, for example, a GED program, or are they looking to apply to uh, a job or get a promotion? Um, in addition to these touch points, learners can email, call, or text their coach at any time for support. They can join various what we call open coaching hours, which are similar to office hours at university. So they can just drop in, they can ask questions, they can get help, and they can talk to their coach. Um, and finally, this part I think is really important. Uh, the coaches proactively reach out to learners when they disengage. and um, we found that it's really effective for the learners to hear from somebody who is holding them accountable and you know, kind of encouraging them to keep going. Um, so that's how coaching works. And I wanna share how we know, and we've, we've discovered and pulled lots of data. Um, we know that coaching improves retention. So we actually offer programs that provide coaching 
working and some programs that don't. And it really depends on the type of implementation and how the organization is using NGEN. Um, but learners with coaching consistently outperform learners who do not have coaching. Um, and of course, then now that we've discovered that, we want to encourage uh, more learners and, and more organizations to, to utilize coaching. So um, learners with coaching services complete an average of 18 working hours in the platform over a four month period compared to learners without coaching services who complete an average of seven hours, it's less than half over a four month license. So we have different license lengths where they're a part of our program. 31% uh, of the learners with coaching are very highly engaged. They spend an average of nearly 40 hours working in the platform. 9% of learners who do not have access to coaching are very highly engaged. Um, they spend an average of nearly 30 hours working in the platform. So that's a really big difference. Um, and we have internal milestones that we set. So milestone attainment is 36% higher and proficiency improvement is 17% higher for learners with coaching versus those without. So all across the board, our learners who have access to a coach are really doing leaps and bounds better than those without. Um, in addition to the hard data we have, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence from learners that we call internally, we call them success stories. Um, and uh, last but not least, coaches support learners through the re-enrollment process, which of course helps to um, improve retention rates. So for us here at NGEN, um, coaching has really been key in driving engagement and better outcomes and higher engagement and successful outcomes equate to higher retention rates. My gosh, Christina, is that... I'm I'm like waiting for more now. I'm I'm looking forward to the Q and A. <laughs> this is fantastic. Sure, uh, there's a lot more to share. <laughs> no, I what I loved as well is that you really gave some very clear facts about hey, look, we actually studied this, and this was the this was the result, and it just hit everything that you would want to see in an education uh, solution, and it also hit everything that probably a commercial person, even outside of the education side of things would be like, hey, my eyes are, are lighting up. So fantastic. I really want to go into that a little bit more on the Q&A. And I think probably people are sort of digesting that. I've got definitely a couple of questions uh, in the wings. So we'll come back to you for sure. Um, and since we've got that flow and hopefully you're, you're listening in and uh, learning a lot, let us pass into our, our third speaker. This is Lays Mayuki. Um, Lays, as we've mentioned, has a lot of experience outside of Voxy, but also with um, within Voxy itself, has had a lot of experience and particularly on this customer success journey. Uh, I'm really looking forward to your conversation now, Lays, on particularly on data metrics. This is something that we're often asked, particularly in operations and customer success teams. Uh, reporting is, is up there. And so to, to hear from you is going to be a, a real privilege. So over to you, Lays. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here uh, today with this amazing audience. Uh, thank you, Alex, for the opportunity. Uh, and what I'm gonna be sharing here is pretty much aligned with uh, what Annie and Christina has shared. Um, as Alex said, I'm from Voxy. For the ones that haven't uh, the opportunity to know Vox yet, we are a language, a multi-language <clears throat> training platform very focused on B2B uh, and our mission is break uh, down language barriers, uh, but also supporting uh, business to meet their goals by unlock people's potential. So, um, and I, uh, I was seeing some questions that you were sharing here, how to deal with like objections around lack of motivation of people and all this type of stuff and how to keep learners engaged. And over this time that I have been working at Voxy and leading the customer success team and dealing with many negotiations with customers, uh, one of the things that we learned was the importance of, of Converge, the customer journey and the learner journey to ensure that these are aligned and that we could bring metrics that would prove uh, the value of the, the investments that were being done. And um, 
one of the things that we implement here that has been very efficient in supporting us to keep growing uh, is really um, we did a intense work of mapping programs profile and use these uh, and build benchmarks to really set the learner journey and align the realistic goals that we would be achieving with our customers. And basically how we do that. Uh, so we, when we build this, this journey, we were really focused on understand the challenge uh, of like our customers and try to categorize or clustering their programs in three main uh, buckets, let's say that. So we have like acute need programs, business impact programs, and benefit programs. Uh, what we we call acute need is the programs where we really see our urgence that people really have like this immediate need of acquiring or develop their proficiency. Business impact is like when the business is getting prepared, so they are mapping talents, they want people be developed to be ready uh, for someday assume a next step in their career and then the benefit which is like the more um, let's say broad offer so it's open enrollment people that are interested can join but is much more focused on uh, opportunities and um, like improving the benefit packets or how the the company and the employees are seeing the employer brand and what based also on on these um on these characteristics, we observed that the engagement and the adoption of the platform were really um, increasing uh, as we we go down in this line. So the acute need program is where we have like the people that are more engaged uh, and then going over business impact and benefit, then we see this, this line going down. And this is much related to how adults learn, uh, the more the urgence, the more time you're going to invest, the more likely we're going to be uh, to pay attention and to dedicate time to that. So it, one thing that we do is really focus on understand the challenge and set with our customers and define what is their program purpose. And then based on that, we go and we have like, we de designed, um, a we adapt a uh, Kirk Patrick model, uh, and we designed this framework to really creating these layers where we can set with our customers what are their the reactions that they want to measure, what is going to be the skills that they want their learners um, to learn, in our and which behaviors they wanted to see changing, and then what is the business results based on this behavior change that they want to measure. And then uh, with these, we are being able to really understand what is the challenge and the real outcomes that we needed to to deliver in order to set the learner journey and give like this guidance to the learners on what they need to do. And one thing that is supporting us to setting the learner journey is as we set this program purpose and these profiles, we were able to do some data analysis and build some benchmarks on and understand what would be the behavior of each type of learner's profile. And based on that, we bring to our customers a realistic overview on what the learners will be, how the learners will behave, and what they should expect. So we let's say that we have customers that bring to us this net need of, oh, I want my learners improve two levels in six months. So then we are gonna get back to the data and say, look, what you were saying is not realistic because considering the profile of your program the learners will extend X amount of hours or they are going to be, oh, yeah, <laughs> you can let everything, uh, that's fine. So then we we bring this data in order to support this learner uh, guidance that we're going to be sharing and setting these goals realistic. And this is also part of the how we communicate with our learners, how we interact with them. So we really understand their profile. Uh, we making sure that they really understand the value of the program and why they are doing this. So then we can bring these instructions to them and also give them spaces to practice. So we have been investing a lot on this social learning piece. We are building community. We are supporting our customers really have this space to the learners be able to exchange and to put in practice. And then we are focused on collecting these evidences. So then once we set this framework, an exercise that we also do for each single piece of this framework, we set metrics 
of course, aligned with the guidance that we are going to be sharing with the learners. So this is why we have the, the benchmark to balance what's going to be the business goal we are going to be setting. And then by the end of the program, we're much more structured and enabled to understand how we're going to be measuring the ROI of the program. So then we can define which are going to be the pieces of evidence that we are going to be collecting, how we're going to be measuring it. And another advantage that I see in uh impact that is being very powerful to on the renewals conversation is because we approximate the business area uh, to this uh, exercise and uh, we share this responsibly with them. It's not just HR um, bringing people on board and then no any other stakeholder alignment. So we really align the goals of the program because here we have business result that in many of the cases is the stakeholders of the areas that are going to need support as measuring the impact. Uh, so then basically this is how we structure uh, this journey, aligning the business, like the customer journey with the learner journey and creating this um, benchmark based on programs profile. Please, thank you so much for that really interesting presentation. Um, I know that we're going to have lots of questions as well, but let's start with one that's been burning in the Q&A since we started. Um, and this one is from Amir. Um, did you try, and this is probably for Anya, uh, did you try a marketing strategy where, your tar where you target a company where some of the employees actually signed up individually? And if so, was that, uh, was that useful? Um, I think you mean signing up individual means also um, in signing up individual means also paying by themselves, right? I get that impression, yeah. Right. Um, so the answer is we just started two or three months ago with that for the first time. So I can't really um, talk from experience here. Um, what we do see is that um, it takes some time. It takes some employees. So, for example, we usually when we start with a company, then we usually start with a bigger group of people. While um, what we could see now from the past weeks is that when we start with a company and they sign up themselves, paying it for paying for the classes themselves, um, then it takes some time to um, to well win their trust. I would say. Um, and then it's rather like between teammates that they say, oh, yeah, I've, I've just started this and it's an amazing program or something like this. Well, when we um, need to convince the HR area or um, the responsible person within the company who pays for it, it's a little it takes longer, but uh, it's a little easier to have a, a bigger group starting right away. But I would definitely recommend to try everything. So. <laughs> And I think you can only really draw conclusions for some, from something that you have tried. So if your question was, uh, if I recommend trying it or if I recommend doing it, I would definitely recommend you um, to try it. Yes. Yeah, I think some of these things you can learn from other people's experience, but also remembering that everybody has a slightly different business as you really articulated so well, Anya. Everyone has, everyone's business has a different target group. Christina's group is very different to your group. What works for you may not work uh, for Christina and vice versa. So uh, good points. If I may just say in the in the meantime, it's also, it's not just the different businesses, it's also within the business, right? So, I mean, now we focus only on German, but we used to have 13 languages at Zaloa and we've failed and we've lost so much money because we tried to use the same strategy that we had for our German learners and we use them for Spanish learners, for example, which was usually the US market or the European market. And then we found out that, okay, <laughs> this is just really burning money basically. Um, and so also consider that, right? Like even within your company, if you offer yeah. different languages, that's also completely different. Definitely shows the importance of treating these. Am I, am I might be paraphrasing, so please correct me if I'm wrong here, Anya, but you think of it as experiments, just, uh, so really kind of taking the time to analyze, hey, did this work or not? And in which countries, maybe which target groups, because they could be quite different in different target groups in different countries uh, if you're a more global business. Exactly. I think, I mean, you can't do everything. That's something yeah. that you have to learn, right? At some point, so something that I've learned over the past years 
the more or the deeper we went into a specific niche, the better it was for us. Yeah. Um, so try really to find your niche. And whether this is, you know, for, for example, for us right now, we're really yeah. in this Latinos, Latin Americans learning German, but not just that, then in our B2B case, it's really nurses from Latin America who want to work in Germany, right? So try to find your specific niche when you teach English. Like I keep saying, and I've told that already to a couple of people, so now it's not a new idea anymore, but like IT, uh, IT workers, for example, is an amazing niche, in my opinion, if you teach English, especially um, for IT workers all over the world. And, um, you know, but find your niche, try to find your niche, your voice in that, and then study that target group and then also adapt over time. Because now we, we, I mean, we see the differences, right? Three years after the pandemic, the world is not the same anymore. During the pandemic, we use strategies that don't work in 2024. So, yeah, yeah. also consider that. Anya, first of all, I just, I've seen a lot of businesses through LearnCube and we did a lot with um, another podcast that I was running. People know of niches, but very few people really have that courage to follow it and really pursue it as the way you have. And I think you're a great example of following a niche uh, uh, and really kind of making that work for you. So thank you. Um, I've got a, a question that you kind of alluded to as well, which was uh, what sort of yeah, because we have these different target groups, what incentives, rewards, that kind of thing have actually worked for you? And you mentioned, hey, maybe you can give us some failures as well. What hasn't, hasn't worked as well? Absolutely. Happy to do that. So, um, I mean, um, definitely number one for retention strategy, if you're not a solo business, then number one point, find your whatever you call that retention manager, success manager, but the right person, like we have hired the wrong people and that was very expensive in a lot of ways. So what does that mean? It means that that person really needs to understand your target group. And then <laughs> I come back to this target group, right? But because I think it's so important. And then, um, so strategies that have worked for us or that have actually been failures is definitely not having the right person for that position. It is way more important than you think. It's not just taking care of, of clients that you already have. It's really focusing on this retention. Um, and then really, um, for example, um, if you think about challenges, right? You want to run challenges to keep them engaged. You don't want them only as clients, but you really want to engage with them. So challenges are obviously a great way. They were an even better way during the pandemic, but there's still a great way today. But then also the timing depends on your target group. Most countries have this um, New Year's resolution. So January is usually a good moment. But then in Latin America, it's quite common, for example, to have those summer courses where in other countries, it's not that common, but in Latin America, it's very, very common. So that's also a great moment. In other countries, you have the back to school or something, right? So not like also focus on the right timing to run those challenges and then also give the right incentives. So for example, some companies use the incentive of, Okay, pay for the challenge. And if you finish the challenge, then we give you your money back. I am like 100% against this business model because this business model counts on students' failure. So it counts on actually students not getting to the end of the challenge. And I want everyone to win. I want everyone to learn a language successfully, right? So rather, if you want to give a financial incentive after a challenge, then rather give it to afterwards so perfect now you've done with the challenge now next step and i give you a voucher for this next step right so think about this as well um challenges are definitely a great way um sometimes and especially in 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 the b2b business um it's very much worth it to also run a kind of challenge or this you know like a lot of countries like the us market is very famous for that this um employee of the month right yeah. so you can also have the language star of the month right um that would be also something within the company that um they can gain points and and then you have the language star of the month and also here in some countries you know in germany for example it's not very well perceived doing these kind of things so it's yeah. again it depends very much on your target group and i could continue for hours <laughs> about different strategies but i see others uh um, raising their hands as well. So. Let, let's get to Christina. I'm going to, um, maybe you've got something to add. And then also I'm going to um, go back actually to some of the research that we you know, I've done with the other language uh, leaders that aren't here and we can go on through that. But Christina, you had something to add here. 
Yeah, yeah, I actually did. I mean, we are US based. And um, to Anya's point, this is actually something that we're getting ready to try, um, you know, especially when there are groups of, uh, we also have some B2B. Um, we have groups of workers who are all in the same place, um, you know, experimenting with like engine learner of the month and giving them that motivation. But I do also want to add, it is really important to have the buy-in from the the company yeah. if you're doing B2B that you're yeah. working with um, to have that support from them. And um, I, I think that's key and that's essential. Yeah, Th that's definitely been um, conveyed with other um, language businesses. Uh, mm -hmm. One in particular was just constantly really thinking about consistent messaging within the organization. But the, if the leadership is not involved, it's also a bit of a signal to the rest of the staff this is not important. So getting that leadership buy-in is really key. Lays passing to you as well. No, if I may add, what I used to say to our customers is like, if this is not in the company's agenda, this is not going to be on people's agenda. Because, of course, employees will always prioritize what like the company is telling them to prioritize. So uh, this is really important. We have the buy-in of the the leadership in order to enable, of course, the the employees itself and the learners, they should have the accountability on take uh, the lead of like their own development. But this should be, uh, they should realize that they have a support from the company and the company are really focused on doing that. Uh, sometimes we struggle uh, in like retain customers because they think that the responsibility is 100% ours to keep the learners motivated. And uh, we have putting some data together there we have a playbook that we design it and we have like some best, best practices that we recommend to our customers and we have been tracking the the customers that follow our best practices against the customers that doesn't follow and there is a discrepancy difference on how learners engage. Of course, we as vendors, we're going to be uh, putting many actions in place. We have like the community strategy. We are setting a, a journey that as that we can making sure that cost the learners understand the the value of the program, but if the customers uh, and the, the the HR doesn't support us in terms of like uh, reinforcing the communication that we are doing, give us the, the 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 space, bringing us to the spotlight, then we're gonna fail. And when we do this comparison, we can see that the companies that follows the best practices that we have, they have seventy percent higher engagement than companies that doesn't follow. So. As part of our onboarding, we bring this data uh, to really reinforce that what we are recommending them is not because we are we don't want to do things for them, because we do a bunch of stuff and we are increasing actually now the service that we do uh, in terms of engagement. But it's really important. There is a portion that we cannot uh, be uh, accountable accountable for because we don't have the same influence as the company have. Of course, yeah. we're going to do the much as we can, but we still need to account with a company's, um, let's say, uh, influence on their own employees. That was really all the way through the research that we did, Lays, in terms of it's not, retention doesn't happen once the, the classes have started and once things are happening. It's really starting as early as setting expectations and even at that very first sale. So let me introduce you to the research on student retention. So this is based with over a dozen interviews with operations and customer success leaders. Um, I wanted to really focus on the first big question is here, why do students leave us in the first place? Uh, from the research, uh, motivation and time constraints were the, were the real highlights. Time constraints is a big one because you know, as often um, the case, both in B2C and in B2B, we find that students leave because things get busy and the prospect of learning a language starts falling down the priority list. So time constraints is a big one. Motivation as well. And this can fall into a number of different pockets and different segments, for example, in B2C, from what we've heard from uh, Anya too, B2C and B2B, um, are quite different in their kinds of uh, motivations. Really think about how strong their motivation is for learning and whether or not they're being invited or forced to learn as part of their program. Uh, one of the other things that we heard before was around expectations. And particularly getting this right um, has a big impact 
on student retention. So firstly, learners will have an idea of how quickly they expect to learn. And then if that differs significantly from their real experience, then that's what can really lead to student churn. In B2B, it's really how uh, quickly the company expects learners to be progressing, and that can really impact renewals. And the third thing would be poor matching. So it could be the wrong product match in terms of maybe what they really want or need is live classes, but what they're getting is an asynchronous class, for example. And then it could also be a teacher mismanagement. So let's say that um, they just don't have the right teacher for what they need. It doesn't match the industry or the expectations that that student has for the teacher. But a lot of these things also happen at the point of sale um, in terms of why people leave. You know, are they even a good fit? This is something to really get right. So when do people, when do students leave? There seem to be three main areas. A lot of students don't even make it past go. They don't even start the course. There's a, a second, probably much larger group that try something within the first, first 30 days and then churn after that. The third part is where there are usual renewal points, you know, whether it be a three, six or 12 month duration. And these are also areas where students tend to leave so what are the metrics that matter? Uh, attendance rates, no-show rates, class ratings, um, student uh, cancellation rates in particular. These kinds of metrics are very important and are quite leading indicators of student retention or student churn. In fact, we do a really good job of uh, monitoring this with LearnCube's Insights feature that's just more recently come out. But we also saw in the research that student satisfaction uh, scores from surveys um, hours of learning per month was one of the um, metrics that uh, could be important or, or a leading indicator of churn or retention, um, and then even re-enrollment rates. So one of the things that was um, very clear from the research was how much the best performing language companies uh, invested in both understanding their metrics, but being very proactive once they had that, those numbers in hand. Uh, I asked a lot about also successful strategies. You've heard some fantastic things on today's summit, uh, but from those that couldn't make it, um, onboarding, not just on tech, but really setting the right expectations was a really big part of getting uh, strong student retention during the course. Obviously, it's different for B2C and B2B, but with B2C, that teacher-student communication and even homework between classes was a really uh, useful strategy for boosting student retention and B2B consistent regular messaging within the organization and particularly involving the leadership level was very important. Uh, at a more general basis, we talked about monitoring you know, attendance, no-show rates and those other metrics that matter and being very proactive about that. Teachers have a really big impact on retention. Um, students often stay with teachers through thick and thin. So teacher retention and student re retention can often be highly correlated. Uh, this also can relate to uh, quality control. And so that's all part of how do we make sure that our students have a really great experience. Uh, tailoring and personalization was another aspect that helped people feel that their course was relevant and worth pursuing and staying with. At the end of a course, being very proactive um, about ensuring satisfaction, but actually well before that renewal moment. Um, annual and auto re renewing contracts were a big um, strategy to think about when boosting retention. And there's a lot of other really surprising insights that I uncovered as part of my research. Um, I'm going to be sharing this, but particularly in more detail in the 2024 student retention white paper that I'm going to be putting together over the next weeks. So definitely keep an eye out for that. And if you've already been a part of the summit, you're going to get that automatically. Um, so I'm going to pass this back to Christina, actually. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, you know, quite obviously, you know, just as we heard, Anya, there, are some, uh, there were some challenges for you. But what about for you, Christina? What were some challenges for implementing multilingual coaching? That's a great question. So um, 
first of all, uh, finding high quality multilingual coaches is actually in and of itself a challenge. Um, just being multilingual doesn't actually automatically make you a strong coach. We, we really strive to find people who can connect, um, are empathetic, um, but um, our coaching manager has built a really strong and amazing team. Um, so that was one challenge, but I would say probably a question a lot of people have, and it, it is a challenge, is um, <clears throat> how is it scalable? Because it uh, requires uh, human interaction, right? Um, so what we've done is we've automated to the extent that we can automate any type of, um, you know, like repetitive tasks, things like that, that uh, the coaches might have to do. And we really want them to just focus on that human to human interaction rather than having to, um, you know, manually send emails or so a lot of it is automated. Um, we have created uh, metrics um, and then reports from those metrics that guide the coaches so that they they don't have to pull lists and start ranking people, right? So they, they, they see it right in front of them, like, who am I supposed to get in contact with today? Who's scheduled to work with me? Um, so I think the, the scalability piece, and then I did see a question, and um, which is kind of related to this. I saw it in the chat about, um, I think it was about AI. I'm trying to It find. was. It was um, just whether coach, that coaching role and office hours will always require a human touch or whether you foresee a future where tech and AI fill some of those points? I love that question um, because AI is coming up a lot now. <laughs> um, and we want to utilize it to the extent that we can. And so actually one of the things we're working on is trying to get that um, the initial support, like troubleshooting, everything that can be uh, that we can use AI for in that sense. Yes, absolutely. But if they still need to, like we, we want them to be able to connect with a human if they have to, just like we all have this experience if we're, you know, having trouble with something. Um, I, my personal opinion, are we like in, in the very near future going to be able to replace them? I, I don't think so. I think part of the accountability that people feel is a, knowing that an actual human is, um, checking in on them and really cares about their progress. And so I think that's what makes this successful, but that doesn't mean we can't use those tools in other ways to really help make their, their jobs and the process easier. Such an interesting point you just made there. Cause it's the same question that goes into why teachers remain so important is that it's very hard to replace human accountability, it's such a big motivation driver. And as soon as you know it's not a human, the whole accountability aspect totally changes and what you can do with it. Um, we've got a, another interesting question. Lays, maybe you can help us with this. Um, what post-program review processes have you found work best to retain and resell to existing B2B clients? Yeah, so as I mentioned uh, on the presentation, we put together this framework, uh, which is an amazing tool for us really understand what are the type of evidences that we are going to be bringing um, to our customers. So for example, when we have benefit programs, we are not that much focused on skills learned, behavior change, or uh, we really are more attached to reactions and then business goals. So in these cases, uh, we focus more on not, on not giving that much importance, let's say, to hours studied. And we are much more on terms of like satisfaction with the, the benefit on how much companies are measuring the impact on their cultural survey, on their environment survey. So for example, we partner with a, a company that um, we are benefit program and they what we are aligned is that a question of their cultural survey uh, would be about how much they perceive the English training as a improvement on their benefit. And this helps them to improve eight percentual points uh, on their grace to place to work scale uh, that they, they have. So it's a big impact. So despite we don't have like a util high utilization rate, but the, the employees are perceiving it as as um, a strong benefit. So then these are the main argument uh, that make them uh, renew 
with us, like the main uh, proof. And uh, in another case, is we support our customers, of course, with like we bring uh in this uh other type of program, for example, business impact. We really uh try to understand proficiency gain or which type of courses completion related to business or professional areas their employees completed. And based on that, we collect evidences to build study cases, but we are really focused on also measure productivity gain. So this has been a great uh, support for us with the renewal. So more than like, so again, we came out of like this story of like proficiency gain and hours studied because we know um, our product uh, is completely different than like a face-to-face -face class. So why all people in a face-to-face -face model expect like learners is studying eight hours, 10 hours per month. Like in a, our platform, if a learner studies three hours, four hours, we're gonna still be able to uh, to prove proficiency gain. So, and and sometimes it's really difficult to prove uh, and to break, let's say this mindset that is very traditional and that people expect this high amount of hours. So uh, we try to bring evidences that prove that despite the amount of hours, not like eight hours, we still have like proficiency gain or we have other type of evidence that is proving that people are making improvements. And productivity gain is a great asset for us in this sense. Okay. Please, I mean, you, Christina uh, and Anya, every time we've asked a question, you've just got not only just this wealth of knowledge, but and I think this is obviously part of you being successful in your roles is you bring data to it. You bring a sense of experimentation, trial, and hey, this was the outcome. And I think that comes across as both very genuine, but also very compelling. And I think all of us listening here feel very compelled, inspired, and excited about what we can do for our own companies with student retention. So let me thank each of you individually. Uh, starting off with Anya Spilka from Zaloa Languages, thank you very much for that great conversation around target groups. Christina Akies, thank you so much also for talking us, to us about multilingual coaching, something I didn't really know much about at all. Sounds phenomenal about the impact you've had. And then Lise Maoki as well, the amount of work that you do in terms of, and you kind of said in that last answer, you know, the data that you bring and the evidence you bring to the field is a really compelling way to, to prove why something works. So before you leave, make sure you go to www.learncube. You'll be able to find the 2024 student retention white paper there. And if you have any questions, please ask our support team at support at learncube.com, where you can also ask for your copy of the white paper. So thanks very much for listening. And I look forward to either hearing from you or meeting you again soon. Bye now.